Hello and welcome back to British Murders. This is the second episode of season three, the second one to be fully filmed on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed last week if you managed to check it out. If not, check this one out. You might as well. This week's episode of British Murders takes us to the port city of Sunderland, which is located in the northeast county of Tyne and Weir. Many people don't realise that Sunderland is actually located by the seaside. It's not somewhere you would think of in England. If you think of let's go to the seaside, you'd more likely think of Blackpool or Filey or Whitby, especially up north. But it often gets lumped in with neighbouring county boroughs of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, Gateshead, North Shields and South Shields. Those are the five boroughs that make up Tyne and Weir. Sunderland does have an enormous theatre which holds 2,000 people. The theatre is called the Sunderland Empire and it is in fact the largest theatre between Manchester in the northwest of England and Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland. The Empire is apparently ridiculously haunted though and loads of celebrities refuse to even play there. Actor Sid James, who appeared in 19 Carry On films, actually died on stage at the Sunderland Empire in 1976 after suffering a heart attack. It's rumoured that his ghost haunts the dressing room he was in on the eve of his death. Creepy, if you believe in that kind of thing. Imagine seeing the ghost of Sid James, you wouldn't know whether to laugh or cry. Now if you're not from the UK and you're wondering who Sid James is and what the hell a Carry On film is, they were basically old school British comedy movies. There's 31 films in total, so if you are going to check it out, maybe just do one or two. I always used to like Carry On Camping as a kid if you do need a recommendation. But coming back to Sunderland before we crack on with the story, here are a few more quickfire facts. Serial killer Mary Ann Cotton, aka the Black Widow, was born there. Author Lewis Carroll used Sunderland as inspiration for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. A disaster happened at the Victoria Hall, a music venue, in which 183 children died when they rushed towards a staircase for treats during a variety show. And finally, each year on the last weekend in July, the city hosts the Sunderland International Air Show, which is the biggest free air show in Europe. That's enough history for now. Let's get on to the subject of this story. This particular Mackham, the name by which people from Sunderland are referred, is Stephen John Grieverson. He was born on December 14th, 1970, to his parents Terence and Cathy Grieverson. It was a big family. Stephen had six siblings, but he was always a mummy's boy, according to Cathy. His childhood was pretty ordinary for the most part, though it has to be noted that Terence would often hit Cathy in front of the kids, which is clearly something that can impact a child's development. Despite that, Stephen was a well-behaved child until he turned 11, that is. He got taken to court at that age for a very minor offence. You'd never guess it. He stole a nail. You know like one of those multi-pack bags of nails you'd get from a hardware store like B&Q or Wix? He opened one of those bags and stole a solitary nail. Why he did it only he knows, but he must have a reason. Maybe it was just the thrill. It sounds a bit extreme taking him to court for that, but he had been cautioned multiple times in the past. The drastic result of Stephen being taken to court was that he was removed from his family home. Cathy explained that the decision to take Stephen away from her was standard practice back then if the child was taken to court. Now I believe what she was referring to was a care order under section 31 of the Children's Act 1989. Basically if a child under the age of 17 is deemed to be beyond parental control, the courts can make a care order and place the child under the supervision of a designated local authority. In Stephen's case, he was sent to a children's home in Carlisle, a city located roughly 70 miles west of Sunderland in the county of Cumbria. Surprisingly, Stephen remained on good terms with his mum and often made supervised visits on weekends. Stephen later explained that his time at the children's home wasn't enjoyable as he was regularly abused both physically and sexually whilst there. I did try to find the name of the care home in Carlisle but apparently it's closed down. I can't say for sure that Stephen's allegations were true but in the same vein I can't say for certain that nothing happened to him whilst there. The care order ended when Stephen turned 18 and he then returned to Sunderland. His adult life started as his childhood had ended, full of drugs and theft. His drugs of choice were typically weed, sleeping pills and glue. 
Glue is a bit of a throwback drug here in the UK, but back in the 1980s, glue sniffing or volatile solvent abuse was at its peak. It's killed more people under the age of 16 than all of the Class A drugs combined over the last few decades, but now the practice has all but died out. Despite this, UK charity Resolve, which was founded in 1984, still to this day works to reduce the harms caused by volatile substance abuse. Resolve, cleverly, is spelled R-E-S-O-L-V. Solve, solvents, you get it. As for the petty theft, cars were Stephen's preferred target. He was a big gearhead, by which I mean he liked cars, opposite of me, so it's not surprising that car theft was high on his crime agenda. He also used to burgle people's houses too, which is something that will play an important role later on in this story. 38 convictions in total are what Stephen had for theft since the age of 12, which, when you think about it, is ridiculous. He clearly didn't get better with age and experience in that regard. In spite of all the drugs and crime, Stephen's only real worry was his sexuality. He knew he was gay, his mum knew he was gay, but they never spoke about it. Stephen had aspirations of making it big in the tough and macho criminal underworld of Wearside, and he felt that if his true sexuality was revealed, that would all be ruined. It's sad to think that even in 2021, some people will feel exactly the same as Stephen did 30 years ago. This fear of Stephen's plays a key part in this story, as it's essentially the motives for the crimes he committed. Let's now look at what those crimes actually were. On November 26, 1993, Grievison had met up with a lad by the name of Thomas Kelly. Thomas was 18, and a former pupil at the local Monkweermouth Comprehensive School, where everyone in the local area tended to go. He wasn't a boy who would ever be in trouble with the police or even the local residents. He had great discipline, something showcased by the fact he was a volunteer for the TAs, or Territorial Army. If you're not listening in the UK and you're wondering what the Territorial Army is, it's the Active Duty Volunteer Reserve Force of the British Army. It's now known as the Army Reserve, but was known as the Territorial Army from 1979 to 2014, which fits the timeline here. Stephen lured Thomas to an abandoned allotment in the affluent area of Fulwell. It was one of those places that only real local would know about, and it was a popular spot for drug users to hide away and delve into the delights of both illegal and legal highs. Once there, Stephen, who was at that point a few years older than Thomas at roughly 22, he forced him to perform a sex act on him. No specific details are available with regards to Thomas Kelly, but based on the other crimes Stephen committed, it's likely that it was an oral sex act which he was forced to perform. Once finished, Stephen, now petrified that word would get out about his true sexual preference, proceeded to strangle and kill Thomas. Now, after reading several source articles, it's clear that Stephen used some form of material to garrote him. The specific murder weapon hasn't been identified, but the possible item could have been either a scarf, a belt, a bandana, or simply a piece of cloth or material. The key thing to note is that Stephen completed the murder so quickly and efficiently that no marks were left on Thomas's neck to indicate that he had been strangled. Now, typically with strangulation, the victim would have ligature marks on their neck where either the attacker's hands or where a weapon was placed. It makes you think. Was Stephen just ridiculously stronger than Thomas to the point where not much force was required, or, frighteningly, was he calm enough to complete the act without excessive force? Either way, it's chilling. Once Thomas was dead, Stephen moved his body and placed it in a shed on the allotment before setting it on fire. Clearly, he hoped that this would eradicate any evidence and put him in the clear. The sad thing is, it actually did, for a little while anyway. When Thomas's body was found later that same day, it was thought to have been an accident caused by spilling flammable solvents. As the allotment was known as a popular drug hangout and there were no marks that indicated this was a murder, an unfortunate drug-related accident was put down as the initial cause of death. Stephen laid low for a few months until he struck again in February 1994. Now, Roker Park is a beautiful park with direct access from the beach. Roker Park was also the name of football team Sunderland AFC's home stadium until they moved to the Stadium of Light in 1997. There was a gang of young bikers who would occupy the area from Roker Park to the seafront. They weren't like the infamous Hells Angels or anything though, they were only young teenagers. 
and there were no issues of public nuisance or intimidation from this gang, if you can even call them a gang. Just a group of friends seems more apt, as they were described as the sort of lads who couldn't find trouble even if they were looking for it. Two members of this biker gang were 15-year-olds David Grief and David Hansen. Both were pupils at Monkway Mouth Comprehensive School, as Thomas Kelly had been a few years earlier. On February 4th, 1994, Stephen used the same technique he had used with Thomas on David Hansen, only this time, rather than luring him to the abandoned allotment, he instead lured him to a derelict guest house by the seafront on a street named Roker Terrace. As with Thomas, Stephen sexually assaulted Hansen before strangling him with a piece of material. Once more, no ligature marks were left on his victim's neck and the body was soon set on fire. Hansen's death was again put down to failed experimentation with solvents and no foul play was suspected. Just over two weeks later, Stephen struck again when he lured David Grief to the same allotment in which he had killed Thomas Kelly. The same pattern followed. Grief was formed to perform a sex act on Stephen before being brutally strangled, placed in a derelict shed and then set on fire. It was later revealed that Stephen's way of enticing these young men was to offer them drugs such as cannabis. There is also no evidence to suggest that any of the three victims were gay. Clearly that information is irrelevant as these crimes were absolutely horrific, but it came to light when Stephen later alleged that the boys had performed the sex acts willingly, something which was more than likely not the case. David Grief's body was found roughly 15 yards away from where Thomas Kelly's body was found, which naturally led to police becoming suspicious. This was the third body they had found within three months, and two of them were friends in the same gang. Despite their suspicions, post-mortems of the three bodies failed to establish a cause of death due to how carefully Stephen had strangled them. Pathologists came to the conclusion that the deaths weren't homicides. The trail nearly went cold and Stephen almost got away with all three murders. A press conference was even called with the intention of highlighting the dangers of glue sniffing and solvent abuse to the public. That all changed though when Stephen was suddenly linked to the derelict guest house where David Hansen's body was found after one of his fingerprints was found on a basement window. Police also found a footprint that matched Stephen's on a board that he had torn away from the property in order to gain entry. Stephen explained to the police that he was simply burgling the house, as he had done many times before at other addresses. He was arrested on March 11th, 1994, though he was only charged with attempted burglary and wasn't linked in any way to the murder of David Hansen, Thomas Kelly or David Grief. Now here's where things got a bit strange. You'd think by now, a clear picture would have been painted as to what had happened to the three young boys who recently died in the Roker area of Sunderland. They had a man in prison after his fingerprint was found on the same derelict guest house that David Hansen's body was found in on the same day his body was found. Shockingly though, it wasn't until seven months after Stephen's arrest that the three deaths were linked and regarded as murders committed by one single assailant. Even still, Stephen was not immediately arrested or treated as a serious suspect. The daft thing is, Stephen confessed to committing the three murders to his cellmate in Durham Prison whilst on remand for the burglary at Roker Terrace. He explained how he had knocked a boy out, had intercourse with him and then burned his body. He also said he was high on drugs at the time. This behaviour seems pretty typical for cellmates who are locked up together for months on end and for 15 plus hours a day. What Stephen didn't realise was that his cellmate was actually a police informant. What's even more strange than that is that the police informant didn't even report what Stephen had said until 10 months after finding out. His excuse was that he just put it down to what he called cell talk. I imagine it means that prisoners often will say they've done this and that to other prisoners either to boast or simply pass the time. Apparently, the only reason the informant even told police about Stephen's confession was that he was reading a newspaper one day, noticed the ongoing investigation and put two and two together. Stephen was eventually charged with the murders of David Hansen, Thomas Kelly and David Grief on November 5th, 1995, 21 months after killing his third victim. As with Stephen's solicitor, his mum Cathy was convinced he was innocent. Stephen even said to Cathy, Mum, I didn't do it. As soon as Stephen was charged, Cathy soon became the victim of vandalism and abuse as a result of her son's crimes. Her windows were regularly smashed and she even had a massive hammer launched through her window on one occasion. Seems like a waste of a good hammer to me. 
Stephen's initial denial soon faded when his DNA was eventually matched to semen found in the mouth of David Grief's body. It just shows what a couple of years could do back then with regards to advancements in DNA technology. His trial commenced in February 1996 at Leeds Crown Court. Despite his plea of not guilty, the jury went the other way and found him guilty of all charges. He was finally convicted on February 28th, 1996 and handed three life sentences with a minimum term to serve of 35 years. Sentencing judge Mr Justice Holland said in his closing statement, You are plainly evil and even more plainly dangerous. That's a little bit poetic. As with a lot of these historic murder cases, that wasn't the end of Stephen's story. Back in May 1990, a young 14-year-old boy named Simon Martin was last seen leaving his parents' home in Sunderland after going outside to play with his friends. As with most kids, he was given a curfew and told to be home by 6pm as that was when his tea was due to be ready. By tea, I don't mean the drink, by the way. I mean his evening meal. Some of us in England call it tea, whereas others call it dinner. Long story short, Simon never returned home. He was reported missing later that same evening. Tragically, his brutally beaten body was found in a derelict house a week later by a couple of kids messing about in the house. There clearly wasn't much to do in Sunderland at the time. The cause of death was a brain injury, though the body was noted as having neck compression injuries too. After a decade of no new leads, police decided to question Stephen in November 2000 about the murder, as it shared a lot of similarities with the other murders he had committed. Initially, the questioning went nowhere, as Stephen didn't admit to killing Simon and they had no evidence with which to secure a conviction. That all changed when Stephen was eventually charged with Simon's murder on November 22nd, 2012. As with the first murders, Stephen continued to deny any connection with it at first, but on February 11th, 2013, he finally admitted that he was the one responsible for Simon's death. He didn't admit to purposefully killing Simon, i.e. he didn't claim to have murdered him, rather he admitted to having simply caused the death of Simon. He explained how, as with his other victims, he had lured Simon to the derelict house before sexually assaulting him and strangling him to death. Unlike the other three murders though, Stephen in this case then proceeded to beat Simon's head with a huge rock. This revelation provided police with the biggest insight into what had likely happened with the other three victims. After being forced into performing a sex act with Stephen, the victims would then be yelled at and told not to tell anyone what had happened. Stephen would then see red and strangle the boys to death. He claims to have self-harmed as a result of keeping the murder of Simon a secret for over 20 years, explaining that he needed to admit to it to find peace of mind for himself. He was convicted of Simon's murder at Newcastle Crown Court on October 24th, 2013. Stephen tried to dismiss the murder charge by claiming diminished responsibility, essentially meaning his mental health put him in a position where he wasn't in full control. However, the jury found him guilty of Simon's murder after a nine-day trial. He was handed another life sentence with a minimum term to serve of 35 years. It was revealed during this most recent trial by Professor Derek Perkins, who is currently a professor of forensic psychology at Royal Holloway University of London, that Stephen has psychopathic personality traits. Sentencing judge Mr Justice Ramsey said the following in his closing statement. You are a sexual predator. You will murder young boys or men who do not comply with your wishes for sexual gratification. Precisely what happened is known only to you. There is powerful evidence you strangled him as part of a sexual act, then gratuitously smashed his skull. I hope the family of Simon Martin can now feel there has been some closure of this case, justice has been done, and they can now move on with their life. Stephen is currently serving his sentence at HMP Full Sutton, located near Pocklington in the East Riding of Yorkshire. His own mum has gone on record to state that she is convinced that Stephen will never be released from prison. She also said she would be absolutely terrified of what he would do if he were ever to be released. And that was the story of British murderer Stephen Grieveson. For more on British murders, please feel free to check me out on social media. All the links are in the description for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and YouTube. I just broke 100,000 followers on TikTok, which is crazy. It's blown up overnight. That's, there's some funny stuff on there if, if you want to check that out. I know people think it's for kids, but it's all right. It's entertaining. 
If you want to buy any merchandise, you can do that at Teespring. The link is in the episode description as well. Or if you want to sign up to Patreon for access to ad-free episodes or my scripts and a few other perks. Or if you want to do buymeacoffee.com as a one-off generous donation, any funds received go towards the show's production and research. Links in the description as ever. You can email me some case suggestions at britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or contact me on social media. Any reviews can be left on iTunes and Podchaser, which greatly help the show's exposure and are appreciated massively. But that's it for another episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you like the new format of the video style. With the audio, I've dropped the sort of backing music on there. Just because when you're videoing something and you're recording it, it's a slightly different style. There's less dramatic pauses in there because it's not as engaging. So for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.